Alkyl halides are usually involved in two types of reactions in organic chemistry. The first one is the one that we're looking into this chapter, and that, it, that those are substitution reactions. And the second one, and that one we will see it later on, are elimination reactions, um, and that is our next chapter. But for now, let's focus on the substitution reactions. So when we have a substitution reaction, there are three elements that we're always going to look for. The first one is our nucleophile, that it's right here. The second one is our electrophile, that in this case, as we saw in the previous video, the electrophile is the car, it's usually the carbon that is connected to the halogen, because remember that the halogen is pulling away electron density from the bond and it's weakening it. And so this carbon becomes my delta plus and the halogen has the delta minus. So this becomes my, my electrophile right there. And so right here, the halogen will become the leaving group, right? So remember that we talked about how these reactions happen in, in the previous uh, videos. So the nucleophile will come and attack the electrophile and then because the carbon can only be bond to four things at a time and it's already connected to four, then something has to go. And in this case, my X will leave and that is my living group. So those are the three elements that you always look for. You look for a nucleophile, you look for an electrophile, and you will look for a living group. So here we have some examples of substitution reactions. So here you see in red are my nucleophiles. So in the case of, of the oxygen, the lone pair can go and attack my electrophilic side. And so remember that the, elect the electrophilic side is going to be the carbon that is connected to the living group. So this is how the arrow will go. And then this bond will break. And so that will give us these products. If we look at this one, so again we have the sulfur that has a negative charge. This can come and attack my electrophilic side and the iodine can leave. Um, and then finally the oxygen can attack the bromine and then the bromine can go. And so this is, uh, these are my products. So the nucleophiles, let's talk about the nucleophiles. They are Lewis bases and they can um, they can share, their, they are willing to give away those electrons. So uh, nucleophiles are usually, um, they have a negative charge, but there are some nucleophiles that can be neutral and we'll talk about it later. So the when we have a molecule that looks like, for example, NaOH, Remember that this molecule doesn't exist as it is. What this is, this is actually Na plus plus OH minus. And you know that the role of the sodium is to be the counter ion. So we don't care so much about that ion. That has to be there to compensate for the negative charge on the, ne on the oxygen. But it's an spectator ion and it's not involved in the reaction. So here, the OH- minus that is our nucleophile and that is what we care about. Nucleophiles, as I said, they can also be neutral. And when that happens, the substitution, the substitution product, right? So here we have a nucleophile that attacks the electrophile, and here we have the leaving group. When we start with a nucleophile that it's neutral, what will end up happening is that our product will end up positively charged. And there are some other examples about that. Let's look at another one. So imagine I have an alkyl bromide and my nucleophile in this case is going to be water. So water, you'll learn later, that is not a great 
a nucleophile because it's not charged. And we want our nucleophiles to be charged, negatively charged, so they are more ready to go and attack. But we'll talk about it later. For now, I'm telling you that this is our nucleophile. So what's going to happen is that the lone pairs on the oxygen are that are my nucleophile are going to look for the electrophile and they are going to kick out the BR. Right, so let's show what's happening, so then the VR will go. If I show the products of that reaction, what's going to happen is that I'm going to end up with all of this group connected to it. So one of the lone pairs will form the bond with the carbon right here, but the other lone pair, it's still there. So I'm just going to show it there. And so you see what's missing here? Oxygen usually has six electrons around itself, but in this case, it only owns five. So that's why oxygen will end up with a positively charged. And then my living group, I, I still have to indicate it, it will be the Br with all of these lone pairs and it will have a negative charge. So I started with neutral species and I end up with a neutral um, compound, right? Because we have the plus and the minus that cancel themselves. So remember that about the charges. What I start with, it's always what I finish with. And so this is how we, uh, remember this is how we will draw the reactions from now on. I have a nucleophile here in the case, uh, in it's the lone pair on the nitrogen that attacks the electrophile and then the living group goes. So this is the nucleophilic substitution part. But you see what happens here. It happens exactly what happened in the previous step with the water. Look, let's go back. So here you see I end up with a positively charged water and that's not something that we want. So we have to add one extra step to get rid of that proton that is extra in the water or in this case in the amine. So the first step will be the nucleophilic substitution, right, where I end up with a positively charged nitrogen. But then I have a second step, and that second step, it's a little new for you. It's called proton transfer. But you're used to this because this is simply an acid-base reaction where a base comes and gets the proton. And at that point, these species become neutral. And that's exactly what we want. So remember this. When we start with a neutral nucleophile, what will happen is that we'll do the substitution, we'll get a positively charged species, and then we will have to deprotonate it with a proton transfer. So that's why we need this second step. So if we go back to my previous um, example with the water, what will happen here is you see we have these protonated species, what will happen is that because water is my solvent and water is um, it's in excess, what will happen is that another molecule of water can simply come and you know water can act as a base, right? So that water can come and grab that proton and then I'm just going to draw it right here and then what will happen is that I will I will end up with ethanol that has two lone pairs because it has the lone pairs that it already had plus the lone pair that comes from here and then I will end up I also have H3O plus right that's the side product that gets uh, from here and I still have the Br minus right so you will have to put Br minus right here so yes, these are the two steps that you always have to do when you start with neutral nucleophiles. The first is the substitution, and then it's an acid-base reaction to deprotonate these species. Okay, now let's talk about the living group. So in a nucleophilic substitution, we said we have my nucleophile, my electrophile, and my living group. So what are the characteristics that a living group should have? A living group should be stable in order to go. Because if the nucleophile comes here and it attacks, if my if the living group at this point right here, once it's gone, it's stable, this reaction is much more likely to happen than 
if that um, living group is not stable. So we want to have a stable living group. And those stable living groups are good, are weak bases. Okay, so look at it. Look at it here. A living group is good when it's a weak base. Remember, weak bases are the ones that are stable. Those are the bases that are not ready to go and attack. So a weak base is what you want as your living group. So for example, here they are talking about water being a better living group than OH. And that's because water is a weaker base than OH is. So here we have some of the trends in the living group ability. So as I said, the weaker the base, the better the living group. And that is because that if the base get it's strong, it's not going to want to leave. So if I have that and my nucleophile comes and attack right here, and that will be my side product. So imagine I have that plus um, the OH minus. This is going to be very stable because remember, oxygen is not at a great situation when it has a negative charge. But imagine I have something that looks like this. And my nucleophile comes, kicks water out. So you see how my side product will be water and it's a neutral species. So that's much more stable than having a no with a negative charge. So that's why the weaker the base, the better the living group. And this is important and I want you to remember this. Always count the number of carbons that you have. So if you have one, two, three carbons, make sure that you end up with one, two, three carbons. Because what happens is that when you start attaching and reattaching things, it's easy for you to um, confuse the number of carbons that you have. And so that is um, across the row. And here we're going to talk about it in the group. So remember when we have a group we have fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. And what happens is that as we go down the group iodine is much bigger than fluorine. And so because it's so much bigger it can distribute the electrons much better around the space that it has, right? So it can have the electrons all over here. Whereas in the fluorine the electrons are all condensated right there. So this is a much stronger base than this is because this is unstable and that is ready to go and attack. Whereas here, because I have so much space to distribute those electrons, this becomes a weak base. And a weak base, it's a good living group. A strong base such as F minus, remember we're talking here about the minus, strong base, it's not, it's a bad living group. It doesn't, it, the reaction won't happen because the fluorine with a negative charge is not stable. So here you have some examples of good living groups. As I said, the halogens, as they get bigger, they become better living groups. And the water is a really good living group become, because when it leaves, it leaves as a neutral species. And here we have some examples of bad living groups. And so as I said, fluorine with a negative charge is not a good living group because it's a, it's a strong base or the O minus Remember that O- minus is not happy carrying that negative charge, same as the nitrogen with a negative charge, and so on.